Welcome to our sixth of 11 webinars in our 2024 Women in Leadership Executive Speaker Series, with this one specifically focused on women leaders in news media. I'm Dr. Susan Madsen, Founding Director of the Utah Women in Leadership Project and also the Karen Hayne Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. And I'm the host and will be the panel moderator today. And just letting you know that this event does further the mission of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, which is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. And we at the Utah Women in Leadership Project serve Utah and its residents by first producing relevant, trustworthy, and applicable research, second, creating and gathering valuable resources, and third, convening trainings and events that inform, inspire, and ignite growth and change for all Utahns. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Utah Education Network, UEM, John M. Huntsman School of Business, and USU Extension. So I'm excited to jump right in and introduce the two panelists for today. And I'm uh, glad all of you can join us, and especially our two panelists. Ruth, let me start with a bio from you. Welcome. So Ruth Todd is Executive Vice President and Chief Content Officer for Bonneville International Corporation. And she oversees content strategy for KSL TV in Salt Lake City, as well as Bonneville's 24 radio stations in Denver, Phoenix, Sacramento, Salt Lake City, San Francisco, and Seattle markets. And Ruth is an accomplished businesswoman and award-winning journalist herself. I remember when you were a journalist, I remember seeing you often bringing with her more than 30 years of experience in broadcasting, business, and global corporate communication. And she spent more than 20 years as a news anchor and reporter appearing on ABC, CBS, and, and NBC affiliates. In addition to her time as a broadcaster, she also taught in the communications department at Brigham Young University for several years and served as a spokesperson and media team member for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Ruth, so good to have you here today. Thanks for joining. So glad to be here, Susan. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. And second, Melanie Jones is the editor-in-chief of Utah Business. She worked as a curator and speaking coach at TEDx Salt Lake City for five seasons, collaborating with some of Utah's brightest minds. That must have been fun. She also spent over 25 years in the medical device manufacturing industry and has specialized in various areas, including international account management, product training, digital marketing, and project management. And Melanie is a frequent MC, panelist, and podcast guest, and produced her own dental products podcast starting in 2006 before podcasting was cool. I like that. And I did not know that. That was a long time ago. I mean, podcasts really didn't get popular. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Susan. It's always so nice to be with you. And Ruth as well. Like listening to Ruth's bio, I was like, wow, you picked both ends of the spectrum, Susan. Someone who's been in broadcast for 30 plus years and then me just getting my feet wet in this industry. And I think, you know, just interesting interest, it'll be interesting to me and also everyone listening on that very first question, because I think we're interested, Melanie, for, you know, you you made a jump in many ways, but in other ways not, because you were doing similar work. So Ruth, I'm going to start with you and have you answer our first question, then I'll go right over to Melanie, but let's start by having each of you give us some background on your career path. And basically, how did you, sometimes we meander as women, sometimes we don't, but how did you get to where you are now? I will start by saying, if you would have told me when I was just getting out of college that my career path would look like it has looked, I would have thought you were talking to me from another planet. So I would say that the very same thing that I told all of my students at the first of the semester when I was teaching as an adjunct professor at BYU, and that is this, your life is not going to unfold exactly the way you think or plan it. It just, I don't know anybody's that ever really has. 
But the good news about that is it can unfold in beautiful and interesting and um, instructive ways that make for a, a full and interesting life. So when I started out of school, I thought, oh, I want to, you know, see if I can make this degree do something. And so I started right into news. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I, we moved around the country, we worked in uh, Phoenix and Washington, D.C. for a couple of stations back there. And then my husband's job moved us back to Salt Lake, where I'd started. And then I worked here for another 15 years doing the late night 10 o'clock news. And so um, when that kind of chapter ended, I wasn't really sure. But I knew that I had gained skills in a lot of different areas, especially by meeting amazing people and doing stories and learning from people and doing this wide variety of stories as a reporter and as a news anchor. And so uh, it led me places and allowed me, you know, to get my toe in the door to learn more. And so then I think that rather than a career ladder, it's been more of a jungle gym, you know, where you try this, do a, li a little bit of this, and then you swing over here. So teaching at BYU and then uh, working on the media team for uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and then, you know, working for, I worked 10 years for New Skin and, and their executive team. You were there for a while. I remember yeah, when you moved over years. there. So, and, you know, that real was... quick, before you continue, so you said that ended, was that, that was your choice to do something different? Yes uh, and no. Um, oh. You know, I mean, yes, the, 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 the new contract that was presented to me at the, after, you know, at the end of when I'd been here for, in, in Utah for 15 years was not really workable. It wasn't workable for me. It didn't feel like the right thing to do. It didn't feel like the right next step. So they just said, here's the contract we're going to offer you. You, you know, you need to decide whether you're going to do this or not. So that, so I didn't. But I would have, I think I would have stayed a few more years if they would have given me um, a working agreement that was similar to what I had when I first came. But it was, it was amicable enough when I left there and, and that was fine. And I think that, that I was ready for a shift. But what I did find out working for a company then is I had never worked for a company that was publicly traded on Wall Street. It was on the New York Stock Exchange. I, I, I realized that I didn't quite have the financial literacy to do the job well. I didn't have to be the finance person. That wasn't my background. But I did need to know how to speak the language and understand what was going on um, when we were, you know, with investor relations and the, the important duties we have with shareholders and shareholder value and all those things. So I went back and got my MBA in the middle of all oh. that and um, then just have continued. And I think all of those things together is why Bonneville came after me and, and had this job and, and uh, it's worked out great. And I've just been here not quite six months. And so I'm kind of back where I was uh, all those years ago, 20 years ago, I was anchoring down in the newsroom and now I get to work strategizing what we do with the television and radio stations. I love that. And your MBA is, was such a key piece and then using that knowledge in your for-profit you know mm -hmm. job over you know at new skin yeah. how we taught you all the pieces that make you effective where you're at now i would no way have this job here or be here had i not like i said jungle gym to all, to all those you know you you take every experience that you have you bundled it together and then it takes you to your next thing but i will say I didn't go back to get my MBA till I was in my 50s, 50s. And so that was when I felt like I needed it. And that was a huge barrier to overcome. I thought, can I really do this? Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful I did. And the only thing I would say to everyone listening is I should have done it sooner. <laughs> you know, but. I love it. So my favorite students are non-traditional. We call them non-traditional students because um, one of the things that people have said to me is, you know, I know so much already. Why do I need to go back? But I will tell you, people that have more experience in life and come back actually learn more than anybody else because they have, it's adult learning theory. They have so much experience that the learning connects and you use it. So I love that. I, I'll get off my little soapbox of no. education. Yeah, let, let me just add one thing. And that is so true because I would learn things um, in my program, and I would be able to go back and immediately apply them. It was not theoretical, it was practical. And I thought, oh, I need this right now. And so it was great. Oh, I love it. So Melanie, over to you, same question. Give us a little bit about your background, your career path, and uh, 
And that I'm really interested to hear your connection between the jump over to Utah business. And by the way, you know, you and I talked just a month or so into your jump and you just sounded like a pro to me, just totally a pro, like you've been in that industry forever. So I love it. Let's hear from you. Oh, thank you, Susan. I will echo some of the things that Ruth said. If you had told me that this would be my career path, it's not what I expected. Certainly, it was not the goal. Um, I wrote for the college newspaper at Rick's before it was BYU-Idaho. Um, and that was not my major. I was majoring in French, but I really developed a love for journalism from working at that paper. There were some really great advisors and examples surrounding me. Um, and I thought oh, one of them was uh, Jeanette Bennett's father-in-law. Oh, it, So he was one of my advisors. And Jeanette's husband, Matt, was on the staff with me. So there, there were some really talented people that I was surrounded with. And, and suddenly it ignited a spark. Um, so after I finished my associate's degree, I was looking for a summer internship, found one at a company where I had worked as a teenager at a manufacturer um, that was not far from my house. And about, I don't know, six or eight weeks into the internship, my boss was like, I know that you're planning to go back to school and do this journalism thing. I think you have a, a knack for international business. And if you stay, I'll teach you everything you need to know. Okay. And so that was a, a really hard decision and tempting, especially, you know, a 20 year old. Um, what was being offered to me was not something that everybody gets to do, not just 20 year olds, but anybody gets to do. And true to his word, he taught me so much. And, um, I was suddenly flying all over the world. Uh, my first territory was Latin America. Um, I did that for, I don't know how many years, a few years. I was in charge of Latin America. Did not speak a word of Spanish when I started. I had majored in French with my associates. And um, when they offered me the position, I'm like, how can you offer this to me? I don't speak Spanish. And my boss was like, so learn. So I went down to Costa Rica and I took an immersion course for a couple of weeks. Um, it, it sounds crazy when I say this out loud. It was like two or three weeks. And when I got back, I spoke enough Spanish to work a trade show. No joke. Um, it, it was, um, I think, because of the foundation in French and a lot of the rules are similar and a lot of the vocabulary is similar, just pronounced differently. I think I had a head start. Um, but I also think that's what I was supposed to be doing in that moment. And when that's true, everything falls into place. Uh, um, I agree. So I, I did international for a while, um, eventually got into a different role, international training, moved from just Latin America to traveling everywhere. You know, I went to Europe a whole bunch of times, went to Africa a few times, the Middle East and Asia. And at this point, I'm like 23 um, again, this was not the career path that I planned. I was thinking about journalism, but really all of those things were to pass the time because my goal had always been home family, like stay at home. I had never had an intention of having a career. Um, looking back, that's not how I advise my children. You know, I, I want them to develop a skill set and have a plan. And then life comes at you and, and you do what you think. But I was really just rolling with opportunities that life presented to me. And it went well, but I didn't have a plan. I was just rolling and at the mercy of whatever was offered to me. So I did international training for a while, um, got tired of the travel mm -hmm. after about a decade, which is surprising, but I was gone about um, two weeks a month. I was gone. That's a lot. That's it's a lot. It's a lot. And with it being international travel too, there's jet lag when you come, come mm -hmm. home and, you know, even getting your oil changed in your car. It's like, when do I schedule this? When do I schedule the dentist appointment? It was just, it was, it got to be where I wanted to ground. And is that when you connected with into the dental field? Um, this was all dental. So this manufacturer oh, was a dental oh, manufacturer. Okay. Yeah. So that, that was my entire career worked there from age 15 to 18 on the production floor, um, in the manufacturing wow. area. That's how I saved money for college. And then after college, got this internship there starting in international and, and expanding. 
um, switched to a domestic sales training role, did that for a bunch of years. Um, one day, one of the vice presidents came to me and said, you know, the internet's kind of getting big and we don't have anybody in charge of the website. Like IT has put something together, uh, but there's nobody from marketing. Like IT was writing the copy that was on the website because back then it wasn't yeah. clear like who owns this new yeah. thing, who yeah. owns the internet. And now it's more clear to us like that IT owns the back end, but it's it's a marketing product. Like you need to copy edit it and make sure that it's with brand style guide. But back then it was not clear. It was too new. And so they asked me, like, didn't you take a web design class in college? Because I had tried to go back, like in between all the travel, I was taking taking a night class here and there. And I did take a web design class. And so I was like, yeah, I'll be the marketing person over the website while I was doing this training thing. And that grew, obviously, as the internet grew, as e-commerce grew. And um, I ended up building from ground up the entire e-business department of this company, starting with just me um, doing the website, the copy for the website, working with copywriters as well, you know, but figuring out what was needed. Um, and how did you, I got, then how did you make the, the jump? Um, to to or get the offer or whatever to Utah business. Yeah. So I mean that was lots later. So it was in yeah. in that role doing e-business for a really long time and um finished my degree. I finished my bachelor's at age 41. Mm -hmm. Um and and to your point, I feel like I learned a lot more yeah. as as an older student and ex experienced student. And as I wanted to progress in my career, and I felt all this imposter syndrome for not having a degree, um, similar to Ruth feeling like she needed more financial literacy, my boss told me, if you want to advance, you need to understand finances better. And so go find some weekend seminar. But knowing what I didn't know, I was like, a Saturday isn't going to fix this for me. So I took a certification program at Harvard that was three months long, and I felt a lot more solid about that. Mm -hmm. And then once I had that done, and the imposter syndrome was starting to fade because Calm. I suddenly <laughs> felt like I could, yeah, I have a degree just like the other people, whereas before I was hustling all the time to prove that I belonged in the circle, right? Um, I started looking for other opportunities, interviewed at the Deseret News, got a job offer and um, it wasn't right at the time, but a few years later when I was ready to jump for real, mm -hmm. um, I contacted the man who had interviewed me. His name is Burke Olson. And I said, do you have anything? And he said, actually, editor in chief of Utah business just Oh, gave that's where you jumped. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so it was, I had interviewed with him five years before and he gave me a second chance after I turned him down the awesome. first time. So it was, it was just, a crazy meandering path, as Ruth said. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm going to get into specific questions now. And Ruth, I'll go back to you. Um, and and just a question. You you already answered. You didn't really imagine you ended up, you know, you would end up the career path and exactly being the leader you are today. Um, but how, how, what, if you think back to a few key things, on how you developed leadership skills, because you are in a prominent leadership position now, and your abilities. What do you think a couple of key things? Um, mm. And a little bit later in life, that MBA probably helped. But what were a few yeah. things that really shifted you? But I think that I've always been um, a connector. I remember mm -hmm. being in about the second grade or maybe the first or second or third grade and I remember being out on the playground and 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 the the girls were all sitting under a tree and they were playing horses and coming up with names for horses and I was so bored I remember and I remember looking at the boys and they were all playing kick soccer or, or you know something some game and I said to the light, Let, let's, let's go play together or let's go get together. And I said, we went over and I said, okay, we're all going to play together. You be a captain and you be a captain and you pick first. And I remember connecting people and it was so much more fun to, you know, and so I think that I kind of came liking to put 
people together or connecting people for things and, and, um, you know, having more fun as a whole. So I think I sort of came That's a little leadership. bit. That's that, a leadership think, skill. But, but then I think that I've always been curious. So if you're curious and you're a connector, that is actually a good way because I always want to learn. I'm, I want to learn every day something new. And um, I've always been that way. And so I think that once I sort of started to identify like what I like and what I felt like was par innately part of me, then I would try to grow that. You know, I don't think you become, I don't think you start out a leader, but you look at people along the way and you look at like effective ways that you can connect people for the good of the whole. And sometimes that's what, you know, when, when you get into an organization and it's very siloed, um, it's really important that you can kind of break down those silos and help people as we just saw in the boys in the boat movie, row in the same direction, you know, and be together because then the outcome is beautiful. I love that. I love it. Um, Melanie, a different question for you. Um, you are really passionate around, you know, you love boys and men, I'm sure like I do, but you're passionate around girls and women and you've had, you know, experiences in your workforce or whatever. How did that come and, and why are you so passionate about lifting and strengthening girls and women here in the state? Sure. Um, I was oldest of five kids and my mom was single and mm -hmm. she had three jobs after she divorced from my father. Um, he, she had always been a stay at home mom. She was doing his book work and, and stuff, but nothing that was really on a resume and so when they split, he still wanted her to stay home with the kids, even though they were divorced. And he offered her, hey, I will make your mortgage payment. I will make your car payment if you just agree to stay at home with the children, um, like we always plan to, to raise our kids, even though we're divorced. And um, she thought about it. And I didn't know this at the time, and nor would I have understood it, but she understood that somebody who has the power to give you everything has the power to take it away. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want to be beholden to somebody else. And so instead of taking that check from my dad, um, she took three jobs. She had a day job, a night job and a weekend job. And um, my dad, since he wasn't going to pay for everything, he decided to pay for nothing. Oh, wow. um, so, and she, you know, so many situations of women they're not in power positions where they can go hire an attorney or they don't know what the process is for getting a state appointed defender. And mm -hmm. she didn't feel like that was something that she could fight against oh. to get money, um, like child support. And so instead she just took care of it herself and watching my mom and how hard she had to work. And over the years, how, how her effort was not compensated the same. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, how she was showing leadership skills. And I, I'm watching this and she's still having to work three jobs just to put food on the table and pay for rent. And then getting into a career myself, um, you know, er, earlier, it, it was it was a much different climate when I started work in the mid 90s. Um, and I saw some of the same things too. I saw my my opinions or, or my expertise dismissed frequently, or I saw that, you know, I was an international account manager. We had two other international account managers who were men. I was the youngest they had ever had. I was the first female they had ever had. And I was compensated according to my age and my gender. Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. Not according to you my, knew that. my well, you I knew, knew that. that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can see what people drive and the houses they have and like, uh, and I'm scraping to pay rent yeah. and drive a used Ford Explorer. Um, and I am traveling as much as they are. My sales are growing as much as theirs are. And yet I know that they can support a family, a house, a lifestyle, a car, and I'm single and struggling to make rent. Yes, it was. Yeah. Obvious. Let me let me actually stop you and go over to Ruth because I want to take this theme that you just brought up um, and, and go over to Ruth. So I always, even though we don't want to have the whole thing about barriers, it, it is important to discuss some challenges or barriers. Um, 
And you have worked with so many women. You you can talk about either something in your life or things that you see that women struggle with, specifically in early career. And in your profession, I'm sure it's it might be different in your profession than other professions. And then later career, um, what have you seen in your industry or you know, your industry, you've been in many in industries, right? Um, in the news media. But what do you think, especially here in Utah, are some of the biggest barriers that women face? You know, I've seen it change. I'm old enough and have been mm -hmm. in uh, jobs long enough to see things changing and getting better. And I think that the work your project is doing is helping a lot of those things. But I think that also women are growing up in a whole different paradigm. And mm -hmm. so, and, and yet there's always room, you know, lots yeah. of room to get better. So I think that one of the things that I've seen is sometimes that we don't have, we buy into the old tropes, the old narratives, rather than realize, like, I love hearing Melanie's story. Um, you know, she had some good mentors that said, I think you can be more. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we, we need to find people that will help mentor us and say, I think you can be more. And if they aren't there or we get the opposite, then we have to do that for ourselves. That we have to, like I said, when you're curious, I think one of the biggest barriers is we hold ourselves back by saying, I'm now in this, I'm along this treadmill and my next promotion might be this. Oh. Think big, think outside the box, think, you know, and I think we think, oh my gosh, I've got to pay the bills, I've got to make the rent, and you do, but sometimes that stops us from thinking oh. off the treadmill. And so, Sometimes it's a leap of faith. Sometimes it, and sometimes you can make that leap of faith a little easier because you've continued to acquire new skills. Mm. How do you do that? Yeah. Tell me how you're doing that. Be curious in your job. Hey, can you show me what you just did there? Um, or, or do you have five minutes that you can kind of go over this with me? Things like that. So don't be your own barrier thinking that once you get a job in this type of a business that you're stuck on that same path that everybody else has trod. You get to figure out your own path. That's one. Then sometimes you do get a, a manager that isn't going to help you. And you what you do is you make a change, I think, and you cut your losses and you pivot away and do something else. Never think that there's only one job in one yeah. industry for you. If you are smart and hardworking and dependable and curious and, and always building your skill set, there are jobs for you in lots of places. You know what I would add to that? It kind of rubs me wrong. Can I just say this? When people say that certain kinds of degrees are a waste of time because they're not marketable. Do you know what I'm getting at? Like um, behavioral science or humanities or different things. Um, I will tell you, they teach you so much and and um, in any degree, people are looking for good thinkers and and really deep. So those can I mean, we lock ourselves in sometimes, but those can be transferable to workplaces. Any do you want to add anything to that? Agree? I mean, I think totally. some are more marketable immediately, but mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't know. Someone one hundred percent. I had somebody come and talk to me about the study abroad program at BYU. And they were like, it's it, it takes away from your career path or your path, you know, your major path. And you went, what do you think? And I said, going on a study abroad changed my life because at 19 years old, I had scarcely been out of the Western United States. And I went and lived um, abroad for six months and I, my eyes were open to different oh. cultures and different people and different faith traditions and different arts. And so I brought all of that with me. That has continued to be in the back of my mind. You know, when I lived here, when I visited here, when I worked in here, did a little short, you know, internship here. Anything you do is not wasted learning. Everything you read, like read, pick your books carefully. I remember turning 40 years old and I th thought I'm a reader and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm never going to be able to read all the books I want to read. I'm going to have to pick. I'm never going to be able to see all the movies or visit all the places. So I'm going to have to be really picky and choosy about what I spend my time doing, but do it. Just keep learning and it. keep because it all comes back. You'll be surprised. You'll be sitting in a boardroom and something you've read or something you've learned a long, long time ago will come to mind and you'll be like, 
That's why I needed to learn this right now, here, today. Oh, awesome. So, Melanie, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to pull questions. I'm going to start pulling in a few questions. Um, and, and one of them is, and I know people, people really struggle often with perfectionism. I'm not sure if you've had to deal with perfectionism, but there's a question is in, in the uh, Q&A, what is your experience with perfectionism? How do you combat that to improve yourself? So any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely perfectionism is something that I battled for a really long time. It's only starting to slip away. Um, mm -hmm. it, it took a, it a very work, long time. Yeah, it's it's really hard. And I think it comes from a few places, perfectionism. It, I Obviously, people have different experiences and it's it's sourced from different places, but um, kind of scarcity. If I'm not perfect, I'm in danger. Um, so understanding how to take feedback um, and, and make yourself better without feeling threatened by it, um, instead of having to be perfect to prove that you're worthy. And if you ever make a mistake, then of course you don't deserve this. So you have to let go of that and you have to let go of some of the control. I think part of perfectionism is trying to control the circumstance in your environment. And if I do this perfectly, then I know what will happen. Um, but that also prevents you from learning because you learn so much through failure. And in yeah. software development, they talk a lot about fail mm -hmm. fast, um, fail forward. Um, and if you're staying safe, you can't innovate. So you have to be bolder. You have to be willing to make mistakes. And then um, let that feeling sit, sit with you, the anxiety that comes from it not being perfect this time. And then shift quickly to what did I learn? How can I do it differently? And um, if there are some things that need to haunt you to, to make you better, then do it. You know, me turning down the Deseret News the first time, not that this is a perfectionist thing, but I allowed that to haunt me because I regretted it pretty soon after. And so it reminded me the next time that I am presented with this opportunity and it's not safe and it doesn't make sense and the money doesn't make sense, but it sings to my soul the next time this happens, I'm not going to let it pass me by. I love that. I love it. That is such good advice, right? And, and you know, I found from, from myself, but other people, when I teach about perfectionism, that sometimes you purposely, like, get in a situation, you stretch yourself far, and you expect maybe you'll fail. And when you do you can actually congratulate yourself. I yeah. did it. I yeah. let myself fail and I'm okay. Yeah. So sometimes we have to give ourselves uh, credit. I love that response. Thank you so much. Um, and if you, either of you two see questions that are popping up in either place that you want to jump in, just let me know. Mm -hmm. um, it, Ruth, did you look like you had something else to say? No? No, I just, I think Melanie said it just beautifully. Just figure everything is a learning experience that that you're not held to a standard of perfection and if you are you're probably not in the right place you know but <laughs> but you you learn ev from every single imperfection that you have so she said it great i love it so i'll go i'll go to you and, and switch us a little bit so oftentimes these days especially with women but we talk about having a mentor or a sponsor early in our career or, or certain things, what, what, what would you advise? I mean, mm -hmm. for your own experience or from what you've seen, or, you know, with your, your years, you, you're the one that said years of experience. You, <laughs> no problem. I own every one. I, my age starts, my age starts with a six and I own every one of those decades and I wouldn't change a thing. And I'm having a great my time. Age in my starts with a six too. And so <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> you know, I will never forget. It's like it was yesterday. I was a young journalist. It was not in Utah. It was where I had gone to another place. And I walked in to the newsroom and it was in Phoenix where I had grown up. And one of the women that was one of the main anchors, I was the come at three in the morning person. You know, I was way low on the totem pole, come at three in the morning. And 
she was someone that I had watched my whole life growing up. And here I was in the same newsroom with this wonderful woman and I could not wait to learn from her. And, and I was just probably a little bit overly bright eyed and bushy tailed, but I walked up to her and I said, I have loved you. I have watched you my whole life long, which probably made her feel old, but you know, I said, I watch, and I said, I've just, I think I'm here today because I watched you. And, and she was very, very cool to me. And it was very clear that she did not want to help me. And I remember going back to my little manual typewriter that we had back then. And, um, and I remember thinking that feels so bad to me. I am going to help every woman behind me. I'm never going to have one woman come behind me that ever feels as small and insignificant as I feel right this minute. And, and so what I think that that one single experience did for me is made me, I, I was kind of afraid to like ask for a mentor or ask for help early on, but I was really um, aware, acutely aware. I was watching. I was asking strategic questions. Um, I was trying to get all the information that I could by just observing and asking questions and learning or saying, teach me a little bit more about that without saying, are you, can you mentor me? Yeah. Um, and I think, I think sometimes when you look at the, now I think the busiest people I know is who I wanted to get information and learnings from. And so if you can just find ways to observe them and ask them strategic questions, that's mentorship in a way that you don't go up to them and say, hey, will you be my mentor? That That's just like you're giving them another job. But instead, just can I take you to lunch? Can I take you to get grab a drink or, you know, whatever, and ask you a few questions? Those are fine. But as much as anything, take that learning on your self. It's your own responsibility to go look around. Who's doing something the way you want to do something? And I, I that has been helpful for me. So rather than saying, oh, my mentor was, or I picked up this person, you know, always be training the people coming up behind you without them having to ask. And I and think you that's learn, important. You learn, too, when you're mentoring and then others. Look ahead, look ahead and look around. And now, frankly, at my age, I look behind me. I want to hire the smartest people that haven't, they may not have the experience I have, but they've got different experience. And I want all of that diverse thinking around my table. And so now I'm looking at new entries into the job market and people that have five or 10 or 15 years of experience. They grew up in a completely different time and I need their voice. So mm -hmm. I think you're always looking around for mentorship from likely as well as unlikely places. That, ex that experience that you shared is so important that sometimes we do get hit. I mean, I, I continue to, um, you know, when you put yourself out there with things, but you, you know, learning from that, shifting your, your mindset and then making that, I call them, them transformational moments. Those moments that transform the way you look at something and that made you aware so much earlier, you know, probably that you would have learned it sometime too. Mm -hmm. okay, can I just say, we have to have more women here in Utah and beyond that pay attention to that and really support. There are women in our state, I, I have to say, that have some visibility that are not supporting other women right now. And they're, they're no. highly visible. You know, wow. it's, it's ironic because... I mean, I did. I remember that it was a transformational moment. It was. It showed me exactly who I did want to be, what I did not want to do, and I ended up training enough people um, and helping new people. And they were really talented, and they bypassed me. They've been to the networks. Oh. I trained them, and they went to the networks. That was fine. I was right where I wanted to be. I was also, you know, balancing raising a family and and things, but. It is so gratifying for me still to this day to see some of the people that I train as new reporters and what they're doing in the media world. It's the best. It's so great. And I couldn't be more proud. And that's growth mindset. Actually, we one of the keys to figuring out if we're more in the fixed mindset versus growth mindset is if we can look at others and, and have joy in their successes. I just want us all, all of you listening in, to think about that because I, I have had to challenge myself in a couple areas. Like, why am I feeling that scarcity mentality, but instead of joy? So we can get ourselves to do better. Melanie, I'm going to go to you on a really important question. And I've seen it. It was on my list, but I've also seen it in the Q&A. And you and I have talked about male allyship. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, 
you can talk about good good ma male allies or just some of your thoughts about how can we help and they need help um, uh, lift more men educate we need more male allies um, in all areas of things any thoughts that you can share about the importance or any any of that I'm just opening it up for you sure um, I might have a meandering answer for this so feel free to cut me off um, <laughs> Male allyship has been really important in my career. And let's start by saying, if you think of it percentage wise, like when I started my career, because most of the male, most of the leaders were males, mm -hmm. if I was going to have a champion, it was going to be a male because you didn't have a choice. There was no one else. Yeah. So I've had men support me, I've had men not support me. Um, but that first one who hired me, you know, he saw something in me during an internship and he set me up for this crazy career that it was such an amazing opportunity. He believed in me. Um, later, I had another um, ally mentor when I worked at Unique. His name was Steve Carlisle, and he offered me this huge role. Um, it's what had me leave my first employer where I had been for um, for 28 years. You know, I, I left because this man believed in me and he helped me grow. And then, um, you know, thinking about Burke Olson, who's my supervisor now, the one that I interviewed at the with at the Deseret News originally, when I interviewed with him, I interviewed for a small job, a coordinator job, mm -hmm. because I thought I'm taking a career leap right now. I don't have any experience in this. Um, so I'm gonna have to start at the bottom and work my way up. And during the course of the interview, he said, why are you interviewing for this job? <laughs> and I said, oh, you know, I've got to love journalism. I think I went off course. You know, I'm going to come in and prove myself and hope to develop some skills. And he's like, no, why this job? And I kind of repeated myself. I was confused. And he's like, no, um, I'm going to send you another job listing. Oh, and wow. I, want, I want you to apply for that instead. And he sent it to me and it was a director role. And I had not made director at a company where I had worked for over 20 years. And yet this man in the course of a 30 minute conversation saw in me that I was bigger than what I was doing. And that was kind of a turning point in my career. Even though I didn't take that offer, I went back to my existing job with more confidence. Like maybe I'm more than I think I am. Wow. This person sees something in me. And so I've had three very important male allies. Um, in terms of how we develop more, I have found that the one-on-one -on -one conversations with men um, mm -hmm. and just yeah. explaining to them that this is what it's like, here's the struggle I'm having, or this is what it feels like to be in this situation, or even um, talking to not men. Attacking. Not, yeah, not attacking. Yeah, not attacking. And not in a group. For some reason, it oh. doesn't work in a group. But one-on-one -on -one works like I could pull somebody aside and say, um, you know, if pre whenever the whenever the law was passed about having to have lactation rooms in workplaces, I'm like, you don't know what it was like to be a nursing mom sitting in a bathroom stall with a battery operated breast pump on your lap and milk dripping everywhere onto your slacks. And then having to go back to work and everybody wondering where you were for the last 30 minutes. Like, you know, nothing about women versus men. We're not in a fight here, but you haven't experienced that. So can you just help me like imagine that there are things that we're going through that have not occurred to you and just listen when we need help. And those, oh those conversations one-on-one yeah. -on -one, have always led to, to stronger allyship and change and understanding that you are not being attacked as a man. I just, I need help. There is stuff going on you don't know about. Will you let me tell you? Oh my gosh, I love that. And I love that you've had good examples. My gosh, I'm looking at the time. Ruth, I I would like, I'm, I'm, I could go a million different directions, but I want to get to some at the end. But any quick thoughts to add about male allyship? Because we haven't in in our other uh, 
Siri, in the webinars in our series, we really haven't dug into this. Any any thoughts, tips, things that have worked for you on helping men become allies? You know, gain their trust first. Do really good work. Come prepared and gain their trust. Don't go in and be like militant about you need to treat us this way. Go in and earn their trust first and show them your work. And then you will find yourself in ways that you can have those crucial, critical conversations with them about, you know, this is why we need to do this or this is why it would be helpful. And this is why it's so much better when we have more women in this discussion. And if they have your trust on other things, then then you you have it on more. Excellent, it's excellent advice, Ruth. I'm going to stay with you and give you this question. I, I warned you about this question. Uh, what are a few resources, books or articles, training, whatever that you would suggest to people on the call, um, listening in, that you have felt really useful for you in your career, and not just your career, but you you cross over into community work too. So in in life, your bigger career, right? Well, I like I said, I've always got about three three books going at one time. You know, a, a few podcasts. I've, I've I'm a big podcast person, and you know, I love to po- uh, listen to podcasts while I'm walking and things like that. But I love some of the just really really great business books. And I I they were part of my curriculum in business school, and so. But I remember going back and back, and I've gone back to. Uh, multipliers, uh, okay. yeah, and I've gone and back Liz, to Liz impact Weisman? players by yeah Wiseman mm-hmm. and Liz Wiseman, and I love uh, Grit by Angela Duckworth because I think mm-hmm. that Duckworth because I think it takes a lot of grit in this world, and you got to just stay the course on things. I really liked a book, and I'm forgetting. I'm I'm drawing a blank on his name, but Deep Work, and Deep Work talks oh, about how. Yeah. Because of the world we live in right now, we are so fragmented and our, you know, we have our attention is drawn in so many places that we have lost the ability to focus in and get into a flow state of deep work. And sometimes that's when your very best things, ideas and ways to put things together have happened is deep work. And that was really a good reminder book for me. And then, of course, I always have to just take a break and, you know, have a really good uh all the light we cannot see, the boys in the boat, uh, oh. the, the nightingale, a good escape, you know, things like that. So I, I like a whole books. list there. A whole list. Mm-hmm. That deep work gave me, I read that maybe three, four years ago or whenever it came out, uh, someone recommended it. it and it, it changed my thinking in a lot of different ways. I mean, there's so many structures and businesses right now where, where there's noise every place. Mm-hmm. And if your job doesn't give you if it's all surface, I would say, let's challenge ourselves to mm-hmm. you can, you totally. Can do all the the other things I'd say is there, you can have short bursts of learning in podcasts. So find good yeah, business yeah. podcasts that if you're in marketing, there are just a plethora of good marketing ones. If you're in sales, if you're in, you know, finance, there are all kinds of good places to learn. And then uh, like Melanie said, she did a three month program. You know, I think that our world is offering so many flexible ways to get a certification or learn a new skill, do those things. I used to try to offer people on my team, whether it was project management or whatever, just, you know, you can do it online and learn these new skills. So I just say, keep saying, staying humble for all the things we don't know and want to learn, curious and motivated. Thank you. Melanie, same question to you. Okay, so books. The one that I refer to the most often is Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. Oh, really? Uh, that, oh, yeah, that, it, it's, it's a project management oriented book, but I have used it in every situation, like getting a house ready to sell, selling it and moving. Um, I use the process in this book. It It's incredible for getting just a lot of stuff done and not letting things fall through the cracks. Uh, podcast wise, it it doesn't seem obvious, but This American Life has actually helped me in my work um, because it's an empathy building. Just hearing people's stories from across the country who are in different situations than you are and opening your mind to some somebody else's experience, I think makes you a better leader um, to have empathy and to open your mind to other people and and what they may be seeing or feeling or what could be happening in their life that you don't know about. And I think that 
those empathy building experiences are super important for leadership. And I've heard it said that um, people who read fiction are more empathetic people than people who oh, only read nonfiction. Um, so I love that Ruth bounces back and forth between the two. And <laughs> All the Light We Cannot See is one of my favorite books of all uh, time. It's so I great. can see you nodding and smiling when she said yeah. that. Yeah. And, so and if you have only seen the movie of The Boys in the Boat, you got to read the book. The yeah. book, the book. Oh, really? It's so good. Yeah. All right. Well, that is good advice. So, Melanie, I'm going to stick with you for this next one. You've been involved, you've been in conversations about a bolder way forward. And so, as you know, uh, the primary goal is a seven year so societal change movement is to ensure that more Utah girls and women thrive in any setting. And that can be in home or community or workplace or wherever. So as you think about this and, and uh, thank you for all your support with it, what do you think are two of the most important things that need to be done in Utah to make that happen? It's a really broad question because we have 18 spoke areas, all of that, they all integrate. What, what would you say? I think that before we make any progress on these spokes, I mean, we'll we'll make we'll make progress regardless, right? But I think to make true progress in this state, um, people need to soften their minds a little bit, and I'm not sure exactly how to do it, mm -hmm. how to make people feel unthreatened by this project that. We're not trying to say that women are better than men. We're not trying to take resources from men. Can we all agree that it's not right that X, Y, Z happens? And if we can't agree on that, then we got to go a level deeper until we find common ground. What is something we can all agree on and then start from there? Because you read the comments of, I, you know, I'm in the Deseret News newsroom and you read the comments on some of these articles sometimes and people are so threatened that by making things Here. better for girls and women we're like dismantling their religion or something we're not saying that all women need to leave their homes and abandon their children and go to the workforce and compete with men and like we're, we're it's not that can we just make it a little bit better without threatening your entire identity. And um, I don't know how to find yeah. that. Maybe it's storytelling yeah. um, in a way that's non-threatening to the, to the population because we can't make real change if we have people fighting against us all the time. This should be oh. something that's important to all of us that we all want to push forward on. It is. If we respect and love any girls and women in our life, that doesn't mean we don't love and respect all of our sons and grandsons at the same time it's lifting right. everyone but that scarcity mentality you're talking about fear-based is very strong and you you do see that in the legislative session happening too Ruth I'm going to throw that question over to you too um what are a couple of things are that, that are really foundational to that you think are going to be important to really lift and strengthen girls and women which will in turn lift and strengthen boys and men right Absolutely. I agree with, with what Melanie just said. I think it's super important and to always realize we women are in this together. We've got to put our arms around each other literally and figuratively and not be only competitive with each other, but be lifting that leave every interaction better than we found it, leave every job better than we found it and try to realize that there's enough success to go around, have that abundance versus that scarcity mentality. I have seen women with scarcity mentality that are so, so, you know, bound and determined to keep their little part of the company that they miss growing beyond that little part. And so if we can just make other people feel comfortable, that's one thing that we have to not be our own stumbling blocks. And then We've talked a little bit about mentoring. That's really important. I think see yourself as a leader, even from the beginning. You may not have a position that the, the job title says leader, but be a leader anyway. Inculcate those leadership qualities in everything you do. It will help. It's kind of that self-fulfilling prophecy. If you act like a leader, you will become a leader. And think of yourself as someone who can 
Be a leader by your positive impact. Be a leader by your preparation and your hard work. You lead the way by who you are. And remember that you have one reputation and you're going to build that all along the way. I've been hired at jobs. I've been fired at jobs. Um, and, And yet, hopefully, people knew along the way that they could still trust, even after I'd been fired, to hire me again. And I think you build that relationship or that reputation and the relationships you have all along the way. But see yourself as a leader from the beginning by your behavior. Thank you so much to both of you. I so appreciate you being here today. I didn't get too far in my questions, but we had a great discussion and uh, some awesome questions from the listeners today as well. So thank you, Ruth and Melanie, for, for taking the time to join and sharing your insights and your background on your career path. And I also want to thank each of you for listening in today. Thank our sponsors as well, uh, particularly the Utah Education Network. Uh, Thanks again to everybody and have a wonderful day.